Now we're missing some slides. You guys want me to just go or? Okay. All right. Technical difficulties tonight. Uh, appreciate you being here. We are going, as Paul has said, are going to continue our study in, in studying the seven churches, uh, letters written to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, tonight we're talking about uh, the, uh, the, not the second one in the book, but the second one for us, and that is the church at Pergamos. Uh, in your Bible, it might say Pergamum, but that's too hard for me to pronounce, so I'm just going to go with Pergamus. There's uh, both, uh, depending on what translation you have, so uh, I'll just uh, stick with Pergamus because that's a little bit easier for me, but uh, hopefully that won't confuse you too much. Uh, I want to start, before we actually read the text, before we actually look into what is said to them, uh, to talk a little bit about the background of the city of Pergamus, and I think that that has, um, will be very helpful when it comes to... Um, uh, understanding what Jesus says to them and why he says some of the things that he does. Uh, Pergamos was a, um, a city in the Roman province of Asia Minor, and uh, it still exists today. Today, though, it's called Bergama. Uh, it's a city that's still there uh, under a different name, but it's called Bergama now. And Bergama is primarily a, uh, a Muslim city now. There's over, uh, from what I looked up, in preparation for this, there's now over 25 uh, mosques there, I believe, in primarily a Muslim city. Uh, but at its height, uh, Pergamos was a great city of, of art and literature, and there was a very well-known library that was there. And that particular library consisted of, of uh, it's been estimated, that it has over, had over 200,000 um, volumes um, in, in that library. And these, these scrolls or these rolls, I won't call them books, because I guess that really wasn't the case at the time, but it's, it's a habit to say books when you're talking about a library. But these rolls were uh, on parchment. And what's interesting, which I didn't know this as, we were, as I was studying this, is that the word parchment is actually derived from the word Pergamos. And I didn't know that. I guess, Tim, you knew that. You're shaking your head. Yes, I didn't know that. And, uh, and so anyway, the legend has it that Mark Antony seized this collection and uh, gave it as a, uh, a gift um, to his new wife, Cleopatra, in 43 BC. Again, just an interesting little tidbit there. But among the ruins of, of ancient Pergamos, you will see there, uh, uh, if you visit there, and you can see in some pictures that you can Google, um, uh, but you will see there, uh, among the ruins, the base of, of the altar to Zeus, uh, you'll see the theater there, the Agora, and several other pagan temples. And there were temples there uh, to Zeus. There were t uh, temples there to Dion Dionysus and Athena and Asclepios. Now, if I'm mispronouncing any of those, just forgive me. I'm going to do the best I can. But there were several pagan temples that existed there. Um, Asclepios was the pagan god of medicine and of healing. And the sick and crippled from all over uh, the uh, parts of, of Asia would flock to the temple. And uh, this part might bother some of you, but uh, there were, from what I understand, tame snakes that were actually inside this temple. And what would happen is that uh, sufferers could come there uh, if whatever their ailment was, and they could spend the night uh, in that temple, in the darkness of the temple. And if one of those snakes, this is where I'm going to get some of you, but if one of those snakes would touch you while you were there, then that was considered to be the hand of the god Asclepios touching you. And so what would happen then is that they believed that uh, Asclepios then would reveal to the priests and the physicians of what remedy uh, needed uh, or was necessary for that particular illness. There was also a school of medicine that was there, pretty well-known school of medicine uh, in connection with the temple. And in fact, the rod of Asclepios, which is what you see pictured here, might look a little familiar to you. 
because it is used now in some of our modern medical symbols. Again, just an interesting little tidbit. But despite what we've said about all of these pagan temples and these pagan gods that were there, that wasn't the only, uh, the, the only uh, thing that was wrong with the city here in Pergamos. Uh, there were also temples that were erected to the emperors uh, as, as they were worshipped as gods on earth. And so since this was a capital city in this province, and it had three temples that were uh, dedicated to emperor worship, then Pergamos became the headquarters for an imperial cult called the Concilia. And so the, this cult was responsible for the enforcement of state religion. And uh, they were, when it came to that, they were, they were unrelenting. They were pretty brutal with that. Um, and so uh, that was the case especially under the reign of Domitian, who insisted on emperor worship. And so it was the concilia, this cult, who saw to it that the material possessions uh, were taken from Christians when they refused uh, to either serve in the army, in the Roman army, or uh, to bow down to these so-called gods. Um, uh, and so uh, they, again, were unrelenting in this. Uh, so it's no wonder, as you think about that, that um, the Christians located there in What is said to Pergamos? If you will, turn to chapter 2 in the book of Revelation. Let's read verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamon, Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. The first thing that I want us to notice about um, this section, uh, this, this letter written to Pergamos, the church there, is I want us to notice what is said about the speaker. Now, I don't, it's not that we don't know who it is, because over in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, in verse 1, it very clearly tells us that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. It is written by, or, or communicated by his angel to John. So this is, this is Jesus. It's not that we don't know who it is, but I want us to notice how he is described. The one who has the two-edged, uh, the sharp two-edged sword. 
when we hear that phrase, we're familiar with the passage found in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, and that's probably where your mind goes right away, where that passage says, uh, describes the Word of God as a living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it has the ability to, to pierce deeply and to divide soul and, uh, a soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And it has the ability to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And that might be where you go right away. You might also consider Ephesians chapter 6 where the armor of God is listed there. And specifically in verse 17, it talks about, it lists the only offensive piece of equipment there as what? It is the, as it's talking about the sword of the spirit as being the word of God. But as we think about back what he's saying here, why he says this in the beginning of, uh, of this, this message to Pergamos, you might ask, well, what does all that mean? Why is he describing himself as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword? And, and why do you suppose that this particular approach was taken when addressing the church at Pergamos? Well, let me suggest to you that the church there was, as you're going to find out in a moment, as we just read, but the church there was infested with a lot of corrupt uh, minds, ones that had evidently compromised their faith and what they knew to be the truth. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But here's Jesus, who is about to fight against them by the sword of his word. His words cut and penetrate deep. They are piercing as a sharp sword. He is about to reprove this church, and his words uh, cut deep. And his words are so sharp that there is no heart that exists that is so hard that it can't be cut and pierced by them. You might also kind of bring to mind what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Here is, on the day of Pentecost, we're familiar with this scene, here is the, the day of Pentecost, the day the church is established, and we have Peter who is standing boldly before them, and what is his message? His message is, you have crucified the Son of God. He's boldly standing there and telling them to their face that they are responsible for putting to death the Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for all this time, the one that they've read and they're familiar with all of the prophecies saying he's coming, and yet he says, Peter says, you are guilty of putting him to death. And so you can only imagine the impact, and we read in verse 37, what was their reaction? It says that they were pierced to the heart, and they said, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? How can we fix this? And so we understand about these piercing words. So when we think about it, there is no escaping the edge of the sword. If you turn to the right, it has an edge on that side. You turn to the left, and there again is the edge of the sword. It turns in every way. And so Jesus' reproof of the church here at Pergamos would cut deep. And they needed to hear these words, what, they had, what Jesus had to say to them. And we need to learn from these words as well. And on, may I suggest to you as a kind of a little side, it serves as a reminder, I think, that no matter what the authorities of, uh, that were in the region, uh, whatever they acted like, wielding their swords and um, as they enforced these rules, that Jesus is the one that has the ultimate authority. Jesus is the one that has the sword to enforce true justice. He has the power, the true power of life and death. And he is the one that they ultimately must fear and answer to. But secondly, I want you to notice in verse 13 that he begins with two words. The two words are, I know. I know. Now, maybe you haven't noticed this before, but if you have read, maybe read ahead a little bit and looked at, at all of the letters to the churches here that are listed in these couple verses, he begins that way with all of them, with those two words, I know. I know. In most cases, he begins by saying, I know your works or I know your deeds. And in this case, he starts out a little bit different, but he still starts out with I know. Now, why is that important? What's the lesson for us? So we think about that and focus just on that little part for a moment. What we need to understand is that how intimately he knows us as individuals. 
He knows us intimately. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30 tells us that the very hair of your head, hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, granted, for some of you, that's a little bit easier, not too difficult to count than others, but that's beside the point. He knows us intimately. He knows us very well. But the point is, is that he knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our actions. He knows what we have said or what we have done. He knows what we haven't said or what we haven't done when we probably should have. And he knows us very, very well. And if you haven't read the 139th Psalm sometime or recently, read that. And when you get done reading the 139th Psalm, you will understand very clearly that there is no limits to his knowledge. There is no bounds to his presence that he knows us Instant, intimately. So what he says here in verse 13 is that I know. He begins with that I know. But in this instance, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And so what I want us to consider is not only does he know us as individuals, but he knows us as a church, as a group of his people. And he knows in this particular case, as he addresses them in Pergamos, he knows where they are. He knows of their suffering. He knows of their tribulation. He knows of their persecution and all the difficult circumstances in which they live. And the application for us is that he's very well aware of our surroundings as well. He knows. He knows of our triumphs. He knows of our failures. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, the verse that we read just a second ago, or right after the one we read a second ago, is it, uh, it says that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so he knew where this church was. He knew that they were a group of Christians here in this city that was full of temples to pagan gods. He knew that there was temples that were dedicated to emperor worship. Uh, he knew that the headquarters of this imperial cult were there. He knew very well where they were, where they were trying to live out their faith. And he knew that they had these snake healing rituals in the temples. And he knew all of the activities that were going on uh, in the city and, and, and all of this work of Satan. And some will even say, as you see the picture here, some even think that perhaps when Jesus says that I know where you dwell and talking about Satan's throne, that they're actually talking about this place right here, which is Zeus's temple. And I don't know if he is or not. This is just a model, of course, but... Um, maybe that's what he was referring to. I, I'm not sure. But Jesus was very, very familiar with where they were. He knew their environment. And he knows what our environments are as well and what we're confronted with on a daily basis. But despite all of that, he commends them in verse 13. He commends them in verse 13 for doing what? For holding fast to his name and not denying the faith he offers them high praise. And he specifically mentions this man named Antipas, who is described as my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Well, we don't know a whole lot about Antipas. This is only the only mention that, uh, that I'm aware of, of mention of this, of this man. And, uh, but for whatever reason... Here is someone that Jesus calls out by name, specifically calling out this man by name, and he says he is my witness and my faithful one. And when you look at secular writings, they will tell you that, and they indicate that Antipas was an elder of the church at Pergamos. Don't know if that's 100% true or not, but that's what historical writings will say. But they also say that this man, whoever this was, whether he was an elder of the church or not, but he was burned alive publicly for his faith. And he is commended by Jesus himself. Here is Jesus. These are the words of Jesus here in chapter 2. And he's called by name and he's commended right here of a man who is willing to stand firm in his faith, despite his surroundings, despite the influences that may have existed there in Pergamos, and evidently was willing to die for the cause of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, that's pretty powerful. 
And if I may say so, to me, that's inspiring. That here's Jesus himself calling him by name on how, how faithful that he was. But you know what? In the day of judgment, Jesus will do the exact same thing for us. We're told in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 that if we will confess him before men, that he will confess our name to the Father. And as we think about that, that's a pretty glorious thought. And so here is this church who is commended for holding fast the name of Christ, for not denying their faith despite the environment in which they lived. And by the way, this is the only church that we know of anyway that we have writings of that experienced someone dying for their faith. And so here's this church commended for that. Here's a group of God's people living in a pretty perverse city. And they're trying to live out their faith on Satan's home turf, you might say. When you think about it, you know, you think about this phrase, Satan's throne. I don't know, this is maybe just somewhat of a side point, but... I think that there's places that we can call today Satan's throne. Um, I think that uh, if, we, if we think about it, that we, we could say that Satan has friends in government. Uh, we can say that Satan has friends in businesses. He has friends on the internet. And if I may say so, he has some friends in so-called churches. And so as we try to make application for what's said, just kind of put it in, in perspective with, uh, with our lives. It's not easy sometimes to live and be faithful here, considering our environment sometimes. And so this should serve as an encouragement to all that are trying to live faithful, that whether you live in a host with a hostile government or maybe you live in a hostile home, uh, it can be done. And God recognizes that. There's a great battle that exists between God and Satan. And we here, this group of people, are commended for uh, not yielding any ground. But as we go on, we also know that he did have some negative things to say. Yeah, he says there in, um, in verse 14, but, here's a transition, <laughs> but I do have a few things against you. I do have a few things against you. And the first thing that needs to be said is as we've talked about everything so far up to this point in the lesson, it's been very positive. We've had a great example in Antipas. They're commended for doing well. Everything's been good up to this point. But then we have this but in this transition. He says, I do have a few things against you. And so the first thing that we need to say is that although Jesus points out all of this good stuff that they were doing, it doesn't outweigh the bad. It doesn't outweigh the bad. And so the application for us is that we cannot do enough good in hope of offsetting bad. This is a myth. And this is a seed, I believe, planted by Satan himself. And so we need to understand that we're not going to stand on the day of judgment. And we're not going to list and be able to list all these good things that we were, we've done in an attempt to justify any sin that we might be guilty of. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to have this big discussion on grace and all of this. I, I get it. But at the same time, we don't need to excuse sin that we know about by thinking, well, we've done all of these great things. And so that's just something, something to think about. So despite being commended for all of the good things that they've done and for remaining faithful in this terrible environment, there were some in their group that evidently were holding on to teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Now, what exactly does that mean? Paul kind of put me on the spot last night, unintentionally. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I have any more, really, explanation about the Nicolaitans than, than, than he did. Um, but I do want to talk about Balaam for a moment. What, what is meant by these words? Uh, it specifically says there that Balaam kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. And perhaps you might remember the story back in the book of Numbers. I think it's somewhere around Numbers 22 through 25 or something along those lines. Uh, but here's the story, and we're not going to go back and do a whole lot of detail just because of time, but I think it's important to understand uh, what this, why he's referencing this, what happened back in the book of Numbers. Um, Balaam was a prophet during the time of Balak. 
and he was a king of Moab at the time. And Balak was, quite honestly, he was concerned about the children of Israel. And he was worried about them. He, uh, the children of Israel, they're on their way to Canaan, and, and he was worried about them. He was afraid that uh, they were going to defeat him. And so Balak came to Balaam and asked him to pronounce a curse on the children of Israel in hopes that he might drive them out of the land. And so uh, the interesting thing is that Balaam was actually willing to do this um, as long as God gives me permission to. And uh, all, that's another story by, by, by itself. But uh, So here is, uh, long story short, he, he wasn't ever given permission, even though that Balaam had inquired about this several times. And so Balak, in, during this whole story, had promised Balaam a very handsome reward if uh, he could pronounce a curse on the children of Israel, but it never happened, and he was very upset. But later, Balaam figured out a way to get his reward from Balak. And he advised the Moabites on how to entice the people of Israel with prostitutes and idolatry. And he realized that he couldn't curse Israel directly. So he came up with a plan for Israel to bring a curse upon themselves. And so in a nutshell, Balak followed the advice. As a result, Israel fell into sin they started worshiping Baal of Peor, and they committed fornication with the Midianite women. And because all of this, then God sent a plague and killed 24,000 of those men. Now, the story became infamous because if you know, uh, notice it's been referenced even in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 15, uh, Peter there on that occasion, uh, he, he kind of compares the false teachers to Balaam. In Jude chapter 1, in, in verse 11, he, Jude echoes this statement here, associating Balaam with the selling of one's soul for financial gain. And so now we have in Revelation chapter 2, here is Jesus using this example of Balaam. So it was a pretty serious thing. And he's using that as he talks to the church at Pergamos. And so now, uh, knowing that story, I think, helps us understand this comparison to Balaam here in chapter 2. Like Balaam, what was going on? Some in the church at Pergamos were prostituting their influence to the seducing of God's people into idolatry and into impurity. Some evidently were teaching that it was lawful to eat things sacrificed to idols and that simple fornication wasn't sin. And so they drew men into, uh, into their impure practices, into their impure worship, just like Balaam did the Israelites back in the book of Numbers. Just as Balaam had placed a stumbling block before the children of Israel, these individuals who were eating, sacrificed, uh, meats, uh, eating things that were sacrificed to idols was a stumbling block for Christians. Now, from what I understand in preparing for this, is that under the Roman persecution at the time, um, that we mentioned earlier, that Christians were denied the right to buy food unless they offered worship to the emperors. And so again, understand, it helps understand the circumstances in which these people lived. And so food was hard to come by for the faithful. But there was plenty to be had if they participated in these public feasts to the pagan gods where the meat of animals who had been sacrificed to these pagan gods was served to the public. And evidently, from what I understand, some Christians gave in to that, and they participated in these feasts. And these feasts were oftentimes accompanied by drunkenness and uh, riotous behavior and unrestrained sexual behavior. And so you can kind of understand why this was said. Again, regarding the Nicolaitans, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to offer, but I can tell you this. Most believe that this group of people, for whatever they were, went too far in these love feasts, and they became just as bad as the pagans that they were associated with. But no matter what the details were, the point is, the main point of this passage, and what is being said here to Pergamos was, that they had compromised the truth. They had compromised the truth. Rather than hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, whatever those were, rather than hating them like the church at Ephesus did and was said, as we talked about last night, they didn't hate them. They participated in them. 
and they compromised what they knew to be the right way. And the point is, is that they were not keeping the church pure. Evidently, the prevailing attitude was something very similar to this. If you'll bear with me just for a moment. Evidently, the prevailing attitude at Pergamos was, well, you know, we preach the doctrine of Christ here, and we teach what his apostles taught. Um, but if you don't agree with that, then we'll still make room for you in our fellowship. And if you disagree what we believe about idol worship, that, that's okay. You can still be counted among us. We're, we're welcoming here. And if you frequent uh, temple prostitutes from time to time, then, you know, we frown on that, but you're still welcome to worship with, worship with us here. Now, that sounds a little extreme, right? Sounds a little extreme when you put it that way. Or does it? Because when you think about it, doesn't that sound very much like the religious world today? It really does when you stop and think about it. We're very familiar with this attitude because we see it all the time. And unfortunately, the point of us studying this is, unfortunately, it has become known even in the Lord's church, which is why we need to study this and why we need to think about this. Brethren, we need to work hard to keep the church pure, to keep it unblemished, to keep it exactly like Christ established it, exactly like he authorized it, if we don't stand up for truth and if we don't stand against error, then all of a sudden, before we know it, we eventually have this mixture of truth and error. We have this mixture of a little bit of purity and a little bit of impurity. And before you know it, the church doesn't look like anything like it was supposed to. And if you don't believe that, then do a study of church history and let me know what you find out. Because that is exactly what has happened over the years. Start in Acts chapter 2 when the church was established and do church history and understand what has happened and what has evolved over the years. And just look up, and I say the yellow pages, but those don't exist anymore today. But just go look it up as to how many different denominations and churches exist. Because people didn't keep it pure. People didn't stand for truth. Didn't keep those things out. So the application is pretty simple. Stay away from evil influences. Avoid situations that can cause you to stumble. Stay away from activities that are not wholesome and not righteous. Don't join in with the sinful worldly activities because let's face it and let's all admit it, Satan makes sin look pretty good. He's good at his job. He makes it look attractive. But if we don't strive to keep ourselves pure, and if we don't stay on the alert always, being diligent to keep this church here in Kaysville pure, then we can end up just like Pergamos. This is why as elders that we're charged with protecting the flock. This is why we have to exercise discipline from time to time. This is why we have to study important subjects like authority. This is why that we have to emphasize, or why we do emphasize, teaching our children from a very, very young age is so that they know, so that we can keep this church pure. This is why that we're looking at the churches here in, in Revelation to understand what Jesus says to them and to learn from those things, to do everything that we can to make sure that we aren't here in Kaysville a compromising church. That's why we're talking about it. And so what's the admonition? It's very simple, isn't it? He tells them there they need to repent. He says that you need to repent, which is a sorrow of heart that leads to a change in behavior. They had to change what they were doing. They had to change their attitude towards certain things. Jesus accused them of tolerating 
something that he hated. They had compromised, and this was unacceptable. And so he tells them that they need to repent, or he promised that he was going to make war against them with the sword of his mouth. Now, I'm not 100% sure exactly what is meant by making war with the sword of his mouth, but it seems to me that if they didn't repent and they didn't change, then he had the authority and he had the willingness to pronounce judgment upon them as he has the right and the authority to do. And some of the recipients of this, some of these people here in Pergamos, may have feared the sword of the government. Some may have feared uh, the government, especially when they saw Antipas put to death the way that he was publicly. But Jesus saying, the one who must be feared is me. And so he's telling them to repent or there will be punishment. He finishes in verse 17, and Paul kind of spoke to this last night. And I think he's exactly right with what he said. In verse 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What he's saying is exactly what Paul said, and that is these words need to be listened to and they need to be heeded. I think he is emphasizing that these things need to be taken very seriously. These are words of Jesus stated directly to this church at Pergamos, and he says, if you have ears, then open them and listen to what I have to say. These things that I'm telling you have eternal importance. These are the words of God himself. And they're applicable to us today, and so we need to take them just as serious. And so I think he's right. He's just emphasizing that we need to pay attention. And he ends with a promise. For those who overcome, a great reward awaits them. And as we think about this Christian life, we've said it many times. It's a warfare against sin. It is a war against Satan himself. It's a war against the world. It's a war, a war against the flesh. It's a war against ourselves sometimes. And it's not enough just to engage in this warfare, but we need to pursue it to the very end, never yielding, never yielding to our spiritual enemies, but fighting the good fight until we gain that victory. So we need to persevere. We need to overcome. We need to trust in Christ. We need to keep our faith firmly rooted in Him, knowing knowing that we will have the victory and be in the presence of our Lord for eternity. And so I wanted to end tonight very quickly with some application to us here in Kaysville. That's really the whole point that we, uh, Rob, Paul, and I talked about having this series of lessons. We thought, you know what? There are things that need to be said, or there are, there are things to, that are said to these churches that we need to hear and we need to apply to us. And so quickly, let me just say three things to you. First of all, we need to understand that no church can live on its past. No church can live on its past. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter how much good we've done in the past. What matters is what we're doing right now. And if we think of Pergamos, we had, they had Antipas. Here's, here, here's this man who stood firm in the faith. He died for the cause of Christ. But that doesn't mean that they were meeting the challenge of the present day. And so we need to understand that no church can live in the past, but also that no church can live with error in its midst. In verse 14, there's six very important words that are said there. He says, because you have some who hold. Now, those are the key words. It doesn't matter what the details were of what they were holding on to. We've talked about that, but that's not the point. The point is, is that they weren't fully grasping, fully clinging, and holding on to Christ. What were they doing? They were trying to hold on to Christ and to hold on to something else. And so no church can exist or can live with error in its midst. They were compromising. And no church can live like that. Sin needs to be purged. And the church needs to be pure. And related to that, thirdly, we need to understand that no church can live in a divided state. Now, tomorrow night, I'm not going to preach Rob's sermon. That's his job tomorrow night. But he's talking about Laodicea and how they were lukewarm. And so the point is, is that we cannot, a church cannot um, be divided. It needs to decide to stand fully with Christ, or it won't stand at all. As one person said, I ran across this quote, we need to guard against the delusion 
of true doctrine by false teaching. And if that makes us intolerant in the eyes of some, then so be it. Christ will commend us just as he did Antipas. If you're here tonight and you are guilty of not being fully committed, if you have compromised your faith, if you have done things that are hindering this church and from being pure and unblemished, then we want to offer you a chance to uh, make things right with your God. And um, if you want us to pray with you or for you, we'd be glad to do that. Uh, we always want to offer, offer an opportunity to, um, or an invitation, an opportunity for those to respond. And so if you will with me, bow with me in a very quick prayer before we sing our song. Our Father in heaven, we come before you now and we are thanking you, Heavenly Father, for the recorded words to the church at Pergamos that we have to learn from, that we've studied tonight. We know that we also live in difficult times, sometimes um, in difficult and challenging environments, whether it be in our workplaces or school or whatever the case may be. We know that Satan is very good at what he does. Uh, we know that um, he can use many different avenues and schemes to get us off track. And we can be tempted uh, to compromise our faith sometimes. But Father, we realize how important it is to stand firm. We uh, understand that we need to not be accepting of compromise. We need to not be tolerant of sin. And so we ask you to be with us here in Kaysville. We ask for your strength, God. We ask for your guidance, for your perseverance, so that we always are a church that you're proud of, that you uh, are always pleased with. And we thank you, Father, for the great reward that awaits us if we're found faithful. And we pray tonight specifically, as we're about to sing this song, that if there's any here tonight that need to repent, that need to make changes in their lives, that they'll take advantage of this opportunity to do that right now. And we offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>